Bangkok is not only Thailand's capital, but also by far its biggest and most economically important city. Starting in the mid-1980s, economic exuberance and cheap foreign funds set off a real estate bubble in Bangkok. Land prices on average rose 25.5 times in just six years. Everyone and their mother set up a real estate development company. In 1995, over 150,000 new housing units entered the Bangkok metro area housing market. At that time, there were already an estimated 300,000 vacant units. In this video, we are going to look at what caused Bangkok's big housing boom and bust. Bangkok's roots date as far back to the 15th century. Famously, the Kingdom of Thailand was never colonized by a European power. In order to avoid such a fate, the country's leaders consolidated the country's people in the hinterlands and centralized its governance out of its capital city. As a result, Bangkok is Thailand's primary hub for culture, economy, governance, and more. Government policies have consistently favored Bangkok over secondary cities like Chiang Mai and the provinces, to the consternation of many. Throughout the 1960s, Bangkok's biggest economic driver was the American presence in the Indochina Wars most notably the Second Indochina War, or the Vietnam War, as it is called in the U.S. Bangkok served as an American r and spot for soldiers. American financial aid paid for new roads and electrification, and set the stage for the city's future tourism industry. It also created a recreational sex industry targeting foreigners, spurring a flow of young women and other migrants into the city. Throughout the 1960s, the city's population exploded from 1.8 million to 3 million. The larger metro area grew 42% from 3.29 million to 4.69 million. This exacerbated a Bangkok housing issue that the Thai government was already worried about. Prior to World War II, Bangkok did not seem to suffer a real housing shortage. However, Allied bombing during the war, at the time the Kingdom of Thailand was a Japanese ally, destroyed a great deal of housing around the city. Investors poured money into constructing industrial and commercial buildings on this newly freed up land. Land started to become more expensive, too much for many Bangkok residents to afford. Many such residents were forced to move into informal settlements, slums essentially, throughout the city. In 1940, surveys found 86 slums, but this rose to 183 in 1950 and 361 in 1960. In 1958, some 46% of the city's population at the time lived in squatter housing. These residents had a special arrangement with the landowners. The landowner knows about the resident and allows them to stay for a small rental fee. But the resident has little rights and must leave within 30 days if the landowner ever finds a more lucrative use for the land. So any housing or shelter constructed on the land must be temporary and easily torn down. These arrangements mean the government can't simply legalize all the slums and then invest in upgrading them, like what other countries have done, because someone else already owns the land. And acquiring that land means going through a lengthy procedure that is well-meaning, but nevertheless tedious. The U.S. military left Bangkok in 1973 when the Americans withdrew from Vietnam. However, the tourist industry continued to thrive. Furthermore, Bangkok started to industrialize following the well-known development path that starts with capital light manufacturing. In my video about Thailand's auto exports, I mention how the Thai government passed new policies to encourage the localization of certain vehicle parts. Policies like these passed in the early 1970s kicked off new investments from automakers. Factories popped up around Bangkok, offering attractive jobs. Migrants left their farms back home in the provinces to do this work. From 1960 to 1970, Bangkok's population increased 3.7% each year, higher than the country's 2.7% national annual growth rate. This industrial and manufacturing boom in turn created an even bigger need for new housing. Despite this, the Thai government has never played a big role in the Bangkok housing market. From 1950 to 1972, the government undertook just eight major housing projects producing just 7,346 units of public housing, or about 330 units a year. They fell far, far short of demand. When applications opened up for 320 public housing apartments in 1963, 20,000 people applied. 
Furthermore, the quality of the public housing units fell short of expectations. Tenants complained that they were noisy, small, poorly lit, and lacking adequate ventilation. A 1973 tenant survey found that 46% of residents at a 1960s-era public housing project at the Din Dayang area in Bangkok were not satisfied with their housing. In December 1972, the Thai government established the National Housing Authority, or NHA. The NHA unified what had once been four different government entities in the space. Their goal was to clear and resettle slums, as well as to build and provide housing. 1973 was an eventful year in Thailand's history. That October, a student-led demonstration ended Field Marshal Tanum Kittakorn's military regime. Everyone left, including the NHA's leaders. A new government arose in 1975. Prime Minister Kukrit Pramoj promised to eliminate the Bangkok housing shortage. In alignment with this goal, the new NHA presented an ambitious five-year plan to build 170,000 housing units for families earning up to 5,000 baht a year. The plan, later revised down to 120,000 units, started off well. The NHA completed 37,188 units in the first two years. But then this liberal government was again replaced via another military coup in 1976. In 1978, the government canceled the NHA's plan, citing financial pressures. Furthermore, many relocated slum dwellers weren't happy with the small public housing units. Despite the cheap and subsidized rent and city central locations, the dwellers transferred their homes to someone else and moved back into the slums. Going into the mid-1980s, the NHA put forward a few small projects, but those never gained real traction. There was never enough money. The early 1980s saw various economic crises affect the Thai economy. There was a second oil shock in 1980 and two bot devaluations in 1983 and 1984. By 1985, the Thai government faced a 70 billion baht trade deficit and carried debts of 350 billion baht. Yet despite the lack of resources, Thai politicians still wanted to build, build, build. They wanted to be seen as doing something to fix the housing shortage, which means flashy construction projects and big high-rises. However, with the exception of Singapore and Hong Kong, such government-built housing projects have rarely seen scale and success. Anyway, in 1986, the World Bank began promoting a liberalization and deregulation policy known as enablement clearing the bureaucratic blockages to more housing. Financially strapped, the Thai government immediately bought into the concept of enablement. From then on, the private industry and the quote-unquote free market, to use a loaded term, would take the lead on building housing. Enablement came at an economically prosperous time. Starting in 1986, Thailand embarked on a massive economic boom. In 1985, the Plaza Accord made the Japanese yen more expensive compared to the U.S. dollar and other currencies like the baht. This triggered a flood of foreign investment into Thailand from places like Japan, Taiwan, and South Korea. Between 1988 and 1996, Thailand received over $100 billion of foreign capital investment, amounting to nearly 10% of the annual GDP each year. This directly boosted industrial economic activities like manufacturing. Combined with cheap labor and plentiful natural resources, GDP growth surged from 5.5% in 1986 to a high of 13.3% in 1988. The military's influence in governance receded. In 1988, a new democratically elected government led by Chatachai Chunhaven, I'm so sorry about mangling all of these names, sought a more business-oriented approach. In practice, this cultivated a great deal of corruption, but it also allowed private businesses to have direct influence on government policy. This economic boom in Thailand meant more people getting better jobs and higher incomes. They in turn wanted to improve their quality of life and own their own home. New policies helped encourage this. In 1982, the Thai government reorganized its housing lender, the Government Housing Bank, or GHB, and directed it to expand its residential mortgage lending operations. By offering attractive deposit rates, the GHB received the deposits of customers moving their funds over from pyramid schemes. 
They then lent out these savings at reduced rates, 10.5% as compared to the 16.5% you used to get on the private markets. The GHB quickly became Thailand's biggest mortgage lender. Totally jealous, the private banks joined in. Mortgage loans from the commercial banking sector grew 41% a year from 1985 to 1990. Together, the two provided the financial liquidity to fuel further housing demand. On the supply side, oil prices fell from their previous highs, and an oil glut emerged. This substantially brought down the cost of energy and thus made construction cheaper. This confluence of demand and supply created a boom in housing construction. Prior to this, private housing developers mostly built homes for the home's owners, who were usually wealthy. But starting in 1986, they went downstream, focusing on producing row houses and townhouses priced for about 50% of the middle class, or about 7000 to $10,000. In 1987, 30,411 privately developed housing units entered the market. The next year, in 1988, that became 45,192 units. The year after that, in 1989, 57,622 units. Private developers constructed some 80% of the total annual housing stock. With all this demand, land prices quickly started to rise, especially at the city's outer regions. Areas once only suitable for agriculture or slums were quickly snapped up for townhouses. Land prices in the outer Bangkok metro area in 1990 reached some 21 times higher than what they were in 1987. When land ran out for townhouses, developers shifted to building condominiums. The market showed signs of overheating. In 1985, you can purchase a one-story 64-square-meter townhouse in Bangkok for about 120,000 baht, or 4,800 U.S. dollars. By 1990, that same amount would only get you a 24-square-meter low-cost condo. Projects sold out within weeks, days, or even hours. For certain projects, customers began queuing at 5 a.m. for a chance to purchase their dream home. The Bangkok housing developer industry was extremely fragmented. While there were large companies like Bangkok Land, most developers were small, family firms with just a few employees and maybe one plot of land. During the weekends, they set up stalls in supermarkets and department stores to sell houses. These smaller development firms had little experience or understanding of their local housing markets. Rather, they just built whatever everyone seemed to be building at the time. Regardless, they managed to secure funding for their projects, if not from banks, then from affiliated non-bank financial lenders. Speculators emerged, purchasing homes for the sole purpose of flipping them. Middle and high-income families traded low-priced apartments or condominiums between each other, driving up prices. Condos priced between $10,000 and $16,000 were the main focus of this speculation. Less than half of these were rented out, and just 32% were owner-occupied. In 1991, the entire market added 130,000 housing units to the Bangkok metro area. This was the first peak in the city's housing market. Things slowed down for a bit after that. From 1991 to 1993, housing production declined to about 100,000. There were multiple reasons for this. The outbreak of the first Gulf War in 1990 drove energy prices back up again and dampened the tourism market, causing a pullback in economic growth. There was also a military coup in February 1991 that overthrew Chunhaven's civilian government, leading to a few years of political turmoil. Democracy was restored in 1992. The new government sought to revitalize the real estate market by offering support to developers building low-income housing units. There were also two other things. First, the Thailand government unveiled a master plan for Bangkok, designating new areas for urbanization. And second, the Thai Securities Exchange Commission mandated that listed real estate companies had to have a land bank. This set off a scramble amongst the big companies to buy up as much Bangkok land as possible. In 1994, new housing construction by both developers and individuals in Bangkok surged once more. The three years from 1994 to 1996 saw over half a million of new housing units under construction. That July, the Bangkok Post ran a story mentioning that speculators were fleeing low-cost units in the midst of a glut in supply. It was the first sign of a crisis. Thailand's phenomenal economic growth, 7.8% a year from 1980 to 1995, led to widespread praise. 
but things started to turn in the second half of the 1990s. Wage increases caused Thai labor to become more expensive. Natural resource degradation was becoming a serious concern. Thai industries failed to upgrade to more sophisticated goods, and other countries like China were competing more aggressively. By 1996, it became clear that the Thai export machine was slowing down. That year, Thailand experienced negative export growth for the first time in over a decade. There was too much foreign money flowing into the country. Critically, there was the Bangkok International Banking Facility. It was kind of like a government-subsidized loan portal originally set up in the early 1990s to help promote Bangkok as a financial center and attract international capital for relending to Vietnam, Laos, or Cambodia. Kind of like the Hong Kong of Southeast Asia, and that was indeed the original plan. But over time, that purpose was perverted into capital arbitrage trades where someone would borrow U.S. dollars and lend in Thai baht. The difference between U.S. dollar borrowing, about 8%, and lending in Thai baht, about 13%, as well as the then fixed currency rate, meant free profit. Short-term foreign loans more than doubled from 1992 to 1995, 18.9 billion to 41.1 billion. It replaced legitimate foreign capital investments, grew a current account deficit, and further fueled speculation in the Bangkok housing market. The banking system was also not fully modernized and struggled to handle such recent liberalizations and all this money coming in looking for returns. Lacking proper regulations, they started lending out to unworthy borrowers. Some of those borrowers were in real estate, but money also went to industry, manufacturing, retail, and most perilously of all, the Thai stock market. In 1995, the GHB commissioned a study of Bangkok's housing vacancy rates. What they found was horrifying. The authors studied a sample of 1,500 projects representing 319,000 units in Bangkok, built from January 1990 to April 1994. It showed that something had gone incredibly wrong. 35% of the sample units were sold but vacant. Many of these were low-cost condos and townhouses. Extrapolating from that, the report estimated that 300,000 units, or 14.5% of the city's entire housing unit stock, was vacant. Released in November 1995, the report had a profound effect on the housing market. The massive oversupply situation became obvious for everyone to see, and everyone rushed to sell their units. The government proposed a few measures to arrest the real estate collapse. However, they either were ineffective or never implemented. Developers canceled their housing projects. By 1997, over 40% of all housing projects were canceled before completion. The stocks of Thai property developers crashed along with the rest of the market. The number of housing developers shrank from nearly 2,000 firms to just 200. Many of these heavily indebted developers failed to make their loan repayments to both their local and foreign creditors. In February 1997, Song Land missed a $3.1 million interest payment. In April, Sahaviria City and August, Joldis Development. The popping of the Bangkok real estate bubble coincided with a continued drop in exports, the Thai stock market crashing, and the overall slowing of the Thai economy. As it turns out, the amount of bad real estate debts actually held by the banks weren't all that much, about 15%. Most of the real bad loans were spent on stock market speculation or industry. But due to non-transparent financial reporting standards, nobody knew the true financial state of the banks, rumors spread of this or that bank possibly collapsing. With that, funds started speculating against the Thai baht, which since 1983 had been pegged at a rate of 25 baht to a US dollar. On June 29, 1997, the Prime Minister publicly said that the peg would stay, but after depleting all of their reserves, on July 2, 1997, Thailand had no choice but to float their currency. The baht immediately crashed. By the end of 1997, the rate went from 25 baht per dollar to 50. Many Thai banks and financial companies had taken out short-term debts denominated in U.S. dollars to fund themselves and their investments. Those debts basically doubled or worse, turning many such companies insolvent. In August 1997, the Bank of Thailand suspended 58 financial companies, which then triggered a run on all the others. Four banks were nationalized. In the end, the IMF got involved. In August 1997, the IMF offered a $17.2 billion bailout, then the second largest in history. 
In exchange, they demanded an austerity program, higher taxes, the ending of certain subsidies, and tight monetary policies. 1998 was a terrible year economically. A thousand businesses were closing each month, two to three million people were laid off, particularly in construction, inflation hit 18% due to the weak currency. Many foreign workers were sent back home, including a million from Myanmar. The IMF's actions during the Asian financial crisis remained very controversial. By turning these private debts into public ones, it forced Thai taxpayers to bear the brunt of the costs for cleaning up after the real estate industry's excesses. Financial austerity meant less public services. 400,000 children dropped out of primary school, and the number of those living under the poverty line increased by 1.5%. Hundreds of thousands of Bangkok residents returned home to their farms in the provinces. Construction would not return to mid-1990s levels for over a decade. In the wake of the crash, the government passed new measures to help the housing market recover. One notable measure is the 1999 Land Code Amendment, which allowed foreign investors to acquire and own small plots of residential land or condos. Laws were modified to make declaring bankruptcy easier, and a bad debts vehicle, the Thai Assets Management Corporation, was set up in 2001 to purchase bad loans. But most banks simply extended the loan repayment schedule until they got their money back. Economic growth eventually recovered, the export machine came back, and developments like the Tourist Authority of Thailand's Amazing Thailand campaign helped bring tourists back to the country. And the consolidation of the housing industry allowed the creation of more professional developer guilds, which more focused on building better homes in tune with market demand. The story of the Bangkok housing bubble is a story of a country unsuited for new deregulatory changes in the markets. The market got away from itself, and the taxpayers ended up having to pay for its successes. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.